just just hold on the chat there. I'll, I'll do the intros first. So, hello, my name's Daljit Nagra. I'm just going to do a little introduction before the conversation begins. So, I'm chair of the Royal Society of Literature, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, our in-person audience, as well as those joining us online, wherever the, the camera is for, for that. Lily, you've got, a, you've got a laptop there and stuff to talk, communicate with them. Um, for tonight's partnership with the British Library, the conversation we're about to hear is part of our Literature Matters RSL 200 series. It's intimate and wide-ranging discussions between some of the finest writers and thinkers working today. Over the last two years... <laughs> the very finest. Over the last two years of the RSL's five-year bicentenary festival, RSL 200, Speakers have included, and I, I'm going to impress you now, some of these names, Gillian Anderson. Ooh. Thank you. Brian Eno. Ooh. Stephen Fry. Well done. <laughs> Neil Gaiman. David Harewood. Marlon James. Michael. Now, which Michael do you think I'm going to mention? You got it. Michael Palin. I think someone said that. Uh, Claudia Rankin. Ali Barber. OK, maybe not. Ali Smith. And our RSL president, Bernadine Evaristo. Ooh, ooh, very good. So tonight, <laughs> if we can pat ourselves on the back, but tonight we're really lucky to be hearing from two humongously impressive and stellar writers <laughs> who should be part of that list after today's event. You'll be part of that list, so you can be assured of yourselves. <laughs> Armando Iannucci and Marina Hyde. As they... <laughs> most stellar of all you see as they discuss their passion they're going to discuss their passion for great storytelling and they're going to explore their shared love of satire and they'll consider why literature matters to them won't you yes yes uh, and can i also mention in passing that if you enjoy today's discussion you may want to tune into my very own radio program on radio 4 extra which is called, programs called Poetry Extra because I recently broadcast the verse that stings. Armando, do you, does that ring a bell? You had a fascinating discussion with Ian Hislop <laughs> about satire. Oh, yes. Years ago. Uh, we yes. have, on Poetry Extra, we've retrieved it from the archive, especially for you. Does it but, get any money? Or? <laughs> it, 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 it does, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your agent should know, yeah. Um, but you've only got about five more days to hear that program. It's a riveting conversation. It's, um, with this conversation about Pope and the thick of it, to mention some. Alexandra Pope and the thick of it, as though they were the same one poem. Anyway, back to the Royal Society of Literature, which is the UK's charity for the advancement of literature for everyone. If you like to know about the amazing work we do with schools, key workers, authors from diverse backgrounds, if you'd like to know more about literary excellence and the winners of many annual awards and prizes. If you would like to attend our one-year-round programme of dazzling events, such as this one, free of charge, then you should join the happy ship of the RSL and become a member so that a heap of riches can immediately enrich your intellectual lives. Find out more online or at the welcome desk in the foyer tonight. That's the end of my plug. <laughs> now, I'm delighted to introduce Marina Hyde, who will in turn introduce Armando Iannucci. Their conversation will last for roughly an hour. Following that conversation, there will be a chance for audience questions. Now, these can be in person and online. So Lily is sat there, and she will be taking the questions. So please feed your questions to her, and she can read them out later on, as required. So now my introduction for Marina Hyde. Marina Hyde is a columnist whose work I and everyone I know who has sufficient brain cells greatly <laughs> enjoys reading in The Guardian, where she writes on subjects from politics to sport to celebrity. One of her most recent pieces was about the intrepid and unsolvable case, the puzzling and mysterious case known as Wagatha Christie. <laughs> In October 2022, 
my very own dear publisher, for I am a poet, Faber and Faber, will be publishing a collection of Hyde columns entitled, What Just Happened? Dispatches from Turbulent Times. I hand you over to our turbulent lady now, <laughs> Marina Hyde. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and also hello to everyone who is watching us on the Living Knowledge Network for our various libraries around the country and also online in other ways. I'm sitting on stage with my absolute stone cold comedy hero, Armando Iannucci. He is the man behind On The Hour, The Day Today, Partridge, Time Trumpet, Saturday Night Armistice, In The Thick Of It, Veep. Avenue 5, I've had to list some of these just because there's so many things that he's done that I might actually forget some really important ones. I, in terms of movies, we've got In the Loop, Death of Starling, and The Personal History of David Copperfield. And it's just an unbelievable canon of total bangers, really. <laughs> and during the pandemic, obviously, when I was really impressed by like, everyone who baked banana bread and stuff, of course this man would write a 680-line epic poem in the style. It's Miltonic, I believe. Um, I just, it is an extraordinary thing, and I really want to know how you did it. Did you do, like, ten lines at a go? Or? Well, yes. I, it sort of happened... Um, yes, so it's, yes, it's a... Mo it's a, it's a it's, I call it a tiny epic, because most epics are about, you know, 12 volumes of a 1,000 lines a, a volume. Um, it, it's, it fell out, you know, it wasn't, nobody asked me to do it. I just, I think like with a lot of, like a lot of people, I was sitting there in lockdown in that mixture of confusion and fear and concern and, but also the strange, timeless, you know, what are we going to do today, more or less what we did yesterday, yeah. and not knowing when it was going to end, um, the sadness about it, but also... That, that kind of sense of community that was developing at the same time. Yeah. All these sort of mixed kind of emotions. And I, I did think, you know, as the months went on, what will my response yeah. to this be? Will it be like a comedy? Will it be a film or a drama? Will it, what will it be? And then this kind of a poem fell out and um, I started doing it almost as a kind of, um, I think, therapy for myself, really, just a way of trying to articulate what was going on, and I found it emerged quite quickly. Although I say that, you know, I, I did about five or ten lines, but I then put them aside, and then, you know, a month went by, and then I thought, oh, I wonder if... And then I added more, and, you know, so it was then 40 lines, and then I put them aside, and then another month went by. And then gradually the pace picked up, and I kind of arrived at this notion of... Um, I mean, it tells the story of... Um, I've been reading a lot of Milton. I, I read a lot, you know, I, I spent three years trying to write a PhD on Paradise Lost. And I suppose in the pandemic, like a lot of people, I started reading those big, long books. Things again, that, yeah, yeah. You know, the yeah. Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, Divine Comedy and, and, and so on. And I think with all that marching around, I thought the, the way I wanted to express what had been happening was in that style of the great heroic poem, the Beowulf, the yeah. kind of, when, when people sit down and tell tales of our heroes and how they fought this and what. And, and so we, I tell the story of this godlike figure called Orbis Rex, who is, which means, you know, world king, <laughs> and how the gods have feared that that title might frighten us. So they turn Orbis into Boris, and that makes it feel much more <laughs> appealing. And just his tale of how he took on, he smote the bat that brought the poison and the, and the and, and, and tell it like that, tell it like a heroic tale, really. It's, it's the perfect sort of form, really, because I know that so many people were struggling about, like, mm. how could they make something about it? And I know you read Failures of State, the, that really good book about... Yeah, the um, Sunday Times Insight team. Yeah, and yes. I, I remember you saying... I just ma it made me so angry. Yes. And there's actually, something about... Actually quite shaking with it. I mean, physically angry. You sort Especially of got to the, keep the, the anger out. The, the chapters on, um, on how, you know, people who were uh, vulnerable or elderly, yeah. the paramedics were told, don't bring them into hospital. Just tell them, I'm sorry, you'll just have to stay at home. You know, and, and, and that, that I, I could feel myself physically getting yeah. quite worked up. But it's yes, hard so. to be, no, it's hard yeah. to be angry. When, when you're that angry, it's hard yeah. to be funny. 
Oh, right, yes. No, I think yeah. you have to, yeah, I think you you have have to, to temper it. Or yeah. not temper it, but I think you have to, you know, <laughs> give it 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> before you, not do that email, that poisonous email you send to your bank or something and then send and then just go, I really shouldn't have sent that. That's, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's that. But I, think, but I think anyone, you know, anyone who writes will say, you can't really write something until you feel... The, the need to. Now, yeah. whether it's anger or whether it's, you know, admiration or whether it's enjoyment or enthusiasm, it ha there has to be something that makes you want to go, I'd like to write something now about that. You know, and that's, for me, that's, that's where it is. And I did, you know, something like the thick of it emerged because I was angry about Blair and Bush and Iraq because at the time we yeah. all thought, this is nonsense. What are they doing? Uh, and, and, and when it happened... Um, I, I want to know why does government work in the UK in such a way that a Prime Minister can do that and that therefore led to me you know probing around Whitehall and asking you know just asking people how does it work and then coming up with something but the thing of it wasn't about Blair and, and Bush no. and, and Iraq but it was a it, but the the emotion led to the work as it were yeah it was it was it was born out that that particular style of process that was so you could it was became so sort of amazing that people who watched that then saw it happening you gave a name for, to ordinary people who don't necessarily look in and watch that i remember the first time we watched that with my and my husband and anyway we got got to the end of the first episode he's like that was amazing and i just said but it was so realistic yes. <laughs> because it was so yes. It was so. I remember you, and I know you always really like to think the realism has to come first. Yes. And then so the research goes in, and and you know you speak to people, and I spoke to ex cabinet ministers and ex civil servants and directors of communication, and uh, I, I, but I said you know I'm not out, I, I'm not out, I'm not doing a documentary. I'm not out to reveal a scandal. No. I want to know the boring stuff. You know what time do you get in in the morning? What time do you go home? If the call came through from a Daily Mail, who would take the call, you know, and all that. And then gradually stories emerge and, and you get you begin to get this kind of identikit of what a typical minister's office looks like. And the surprise to me was mm -hmm. it's run by 24 year olds. It's yeah. run by these spads, as they're called, uh, now, who, who did a degree in politics uh, and philosophy and, and economics at Oxford or at Cambridge. You became a, got a job as a researcher for an MP and then as a junior, then a senior advisor to... Just coming up with health policy. Health policy, you know, when they're 24, 25, you know, the furlough was probably a couple of 12-year-olds. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's just... And that, for me, struck me as, as A, undemocratic, because they're not elected, but B, just extraordinary. Um, and so I wanted to reveal that. I wanted the, the thick of it... You know, I was a big admirer of Yes Minister, which still stands up, and yeah. I mean, it's an amazing show. But the dynamic in Yes Minister was about the civil service trying to stop the minister from doing anything. And that's gone. For me, the dynamic was the minister having no power because... It was so centralised. Centralised in number 10. In number 10 yeah. you know, and this, this group of... They were called enforcers, which makes them sound like the Dementors, who fan out from number 10 across Whitehall, going into the different departments and telling the ministers what they can do and what they can't do. And, and, and fundamentally, how much money they have. And also what they have to say on Newsnight when they go on. They were just completely infantilised. And they, had, they used to have these little pages and everything. They were yes. completely... They were robotically controlled, really. And yes. if ever deviated, yes. then that was where the funny yes. came from. I get the feeling now that that doesn't happen and it's just absolute chaos. It's not... Yeah, what <laughs> would you even do now? <laughs> I, just, I, just think, I don't think in number 10 there is a message they want to send out to all the ministers. <laughs> There's no sense of any, like, news grid or anything that yeah. they... They're t perfectly happy doing sort of 30 U-turns before lunchtime and then yes. just saying, oh, it doesn't matter, nobody knows. It's like a sort of Acorn Antiques. There's a sort of... <laughs> there's, a, there's an episode of Acorn Antiques, well, I don't know if you've seen this one, where they have to do it live because they've messed up so badly that they actually are going to have to go out live. And they're all in the gallery like this and they've got this monstrous producer who just... And anyway, and Judy Waters comes in without her tray and she's just standing like this. And then... The, the people are in the gallery going, should we go back? What should we do? And she goes, don't worry, we professionals notice Joe Public never clocks a damn thing. Yeah. And I sometimes feel like, do they, do they think we can't?
can't notice this yes. now yes. with this with this particular administration. It's so completely chaotic that your life watching people walk in and then no, all right, walk back out again. <laughs> it's um, like they have Liz Truss stands in front of a flag and does that. Yeah. And going, what and are you doing? It's <laughs> just always slightly too long. Yes. What's the is. new picture with the apple? Have Hello? you, seen the, have you seen the new picture with the apple? Is this Liz Truss with the yeah, apple? Yeah, it's incredible. There's a, back, there's a part photographic background, uh -huh. but we're in an orchard, and so you can also see the thing, and she's got a single apple on her knee. It's, I've seen no explanation. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know what I know she's just had Boris Johnson's videographer. They've all got these people as all these personal people. Is this to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol, or is this the... It's incredible. <laughs> I think you see what you want to see. <laughs> I think it, I just, I wouldn't want to put prescriptions around the way you're allowed to play I with your thoughts. I am Eve, and yeah. I have brought... <laughs> it's, it's, it's like one of... It, it's, I've got to show it to you, you're going to love it. I mean, it is sort of government by Instagram now. In the, yeah. I mean, Rishi Sunak is, is the sort of... I was going to say the master of this, but, but that no longer yeah. applies. <laughs> but uh, that... He burned you know. so brightly. <laughs> yes. Now, like a comet, he's left us. Yes. <laughs> Like a, this is like, a signature. Like a Roman candle, he's yeah. now just spluttering, kind of, like, <laughs> just a few little colours and sparks. But Don't re-approach the far one. No, no. Don't re-approach the far one. Um, yeah, but he, he employs a kind of 24-hour Instagram team, doesn't he? So yeah, that, um, just to, like get him in the casual shoes, in the hoodie, in the, yeah. you know, in the little signature for everything. Also, I, how is he allowed to do that? That's the other thing that I think. Yes. They've got their own fiefdoms that they're just allowed. He yes. just signed off on like everything as though it were actually his money. I'm aware he has got quite a lot of money, so maybe. <laughs> but yeah. it was just. No, I think, I think that is the thing. I think under Boris Johnson, there is no control. There is, because there's no care. There's no, he doesn't, he's, he's not bothered by the fact that other cabinet ministers are building up their empires, but because he sort of thinks, well, I'm prime minister. But I that think he would have been spitting at that little one next door, just like Gina Gershon in Snow Showgirls having to push Elizabeth, <laughs> no, Elizabeth Barclay having to push Gina Gershon down the stairs. He's just had enough of it. Is the apple thing just deliberately so that Boris Johnson can spend a whole day going, what, what, is, what is this? <laughs> is this? Is this good? Is this, or should we, I wish Dominic was still here, because I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> so do I think, think that's all gone, Do you yeah. think Johnson ever thought that he was a satirist to some extent, the way he, which is sort of awful because he was writing about... Have you read his novel? Yes, Se I have. 72 yes. Virgins. Seven I have. I yes. own it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, uh, yes, it's I, I it. own it, but I haven't read it. I strongly advise... Is, is it funny? No, it's hugely unfunny. Is it I, satirical? I find all his writing hugely unfunny, but... Right. Yeah. I, yes, I think it might be... I think he has gotten away with the fact that people think he is witty and a good speaker. The, but, all the stuff about the EU, in a way... Mm was like a sort of satire about a place that actually wasn't real because it wasn't true. Yeah. So he did sort of create this kind of, you know, almost Ruritanian sort of bureaucracy yes. of whatever where all these weird things were happening, and but none of it was true. No. And so, no. but I think in a way he really felt that he was allowed, he had a sort of licence, but well, in, in everyone the, knew it wasn't really real. Know, when he used to write a column about that, about how they're going to make all the bananas straight yeah, and, and all that, uh, the fact that they, he would then be commissioned to write another column was justification for him that therefore what he's saying worked and I think he's brought that into government as well. He's maybe the, the most successful satirist ever, he's the only one who's got some, yeah. oh, what about Zelensky, he was in a satire. Uh, he was, yes. yeah, but, but he had a business sense and that he ran a production company yeah. as well which uh, uh, and, uh, and also he was political before he actually went into comedy, I mean he did have a kind of sense of Ukrainians position against Russia and it's kind of Outlook on the West as opposed to the East, and so on. So he had, he went he 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 was one of those sort of savvy comedians yeah. who actually could do something else yes. on top of it. Um, but I think I think what's happened now is that it, Johnson is part of that breed, rather like Trump, who they see themselves as public entertainers first and foremost. And but they don't. But, but actually, in the case of both of them, they've achieved nothing. Johnson no, has no, achieved no. nothing. And I also yeah. think that the public kind of know that he's achieved nothing. You know, Belgium went without a government for mm. 589 days and Belgium just kept happening. Yeah. And yes. Johnson has done, apart from the pandemic legislation, which is one thing, yeah. he's actually done nothing. And yet the country continues, which suggests that 
power lies yes. outside politics, and he's a sort of but he sort of, of he sort of recognizes that because although he's done nothing, that's not the point to him. The point to him is not the nothing that he hasn't done or that he has done. No. Um, <laughs> the point to him is that it doesn't matter. Um, it's about his. That his his narrative that he yeah. shaped, which is, you know, Mayor of London, I got Brexit done. Uh, no, you didn't. Uh, 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 all the big calls on the vaccine. No, you didn't. Uh, uh, you know, but being able to kind of, you, it, so it's a, it's it's basically, um, I'm great because of my CV, and yeah. and this is part of it. You know, I'm adding to my CV by now being Prime Minister. Um, but that's it. That in itself is the program for government. Yeah. You know, Boris Johnson's thin, isn't it? enhanced that's CD. And, and, and then Trump was like that as well, in that he was more concerned about, you know, the ratings. You know, more yeah. people tweet me, more people came out and voted for me. They didn't. And he'd uh, use uh, the stock market you know, as a form of yeah. rating thing. The stock market's doing brilliantly, yeah. which again... Got nothing to, that's also become so unmoored from the economy that it's just another form it's, of, so it's of just rating. a thing it's just it's, it's just more yeah. numbers and he also did yeah. absolutely nothing and then but that i think Apart is what politics part. has become and i think it's partly because like like you say all the power is somewhere else all the power is with elon musk and, and yeah and the, the tech and, people and, you know the you know. The, 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 sat the satires really you feel like politics is just this strange rather tired kind of kind of dusty front of house yes. thing for the real thing that's yes. happening somewhere else and the other thing I've noticed is that um, um, people go into politics now just to become prime minister. <laughs> and when they realise they're not going to be prime minister, they get the hell out. Yeah, somebody and said of Rishi Sunak the other week, he, one of his advisors said, he's not the sort of guy who'd stick around if he's not going to be prime minister. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Mm. You know, the idea of public service is such a sort of weird, like, a what? A what now? No, he's not going to stick around, you know. Like, I sort oh. of remember, you know, didn't people, you know, under Clement Attlee, and so didn't people want to be the health secretary and want to be the foreign secretary and, or just want to be My theory in the on government. this is that they were all, that that was the, that was actually a, an incredibly short period of time where people who had achieved something had gone into politics the, the, before the war and the immediate aftermath of the war. They'd all been forged in this far over this terrible national event and really interesting people who'd done really serious things mm. went into politics but like the whole of the 19th century and before and any time after 1979 is a mess they're all the same and terrible <laughs> and so they actually the aberration of these good people who, yes who but otherwise i think rotten borough is going all the way back through that but it's maybe always been a bit you know yeah and but i think what's happened now also is just but they're it, the age in which they acquire power has, has, has reduced. It, in the, it used to be that cabinet ministers were in their 50s and 60s and yeah. your prime ministers were in their 60s and even 70s. And now if you're not a cabinet minister by the age of 35, then you're not yeah. on the right. And I sometimes wonder whether people go into politics now just to kind of get that out of the way. And again, to yeah. have it on the CV before they then do the thing that they really want to do, which is, you know, become an entrepreneur or, or a you know, make money on the boards of directors of, of various companies. Yeah, like Osborne, who just yes. who just tried to get onto the Times trainee journalism sort of course, didn't work out, and I'll do politics then. <laughs> A number of things happen. And as he leaves shortly after the referendum, then it's straight into the evening stand at all these other jobs. And yes. But I was talking to someone who had seen him, because he, then they go on this circuit round... And you're with all these other people and he found himself sitting, apparently Osborne found himself, you know, you go on, I mean, even Theresa May gets paid 120 grand a speech and I've heard a speech, so, I mean, it's, <laughs> but it's a, he was in this sort of seven star hotel somewhere. You know, Theresa May was dreadful, but I'd have her back in a heart. Oh God, <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. Come back, I mean, an incredibly limited politician who messed up her cards far yeah. worse than she needed to do, but yeah. Take yeah. it any yeah, day, yeah, yeah. all day long now. Well, at least she'd like turn up. She's quite good at the commentary, but she's just like Jeff Boycott, her hero. She actually <laughs> having to watch her actually be a politician was just remorseless and awful. And like, yeah. I can't watch you grind out another century. I can't. But it, well, now she's in the commentary box. She's so lively. All the things yes. she says. She's always, you know, she's lively in the House of Commons. And she bucks the uh, she she bucks the, the the rule now, which is like she hasn't got out of you know she hasn't resigned her seat. And she, yeah, she's you know, not. She's, she actually is just going to carry on opening fates in Maidenhead like forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> with no. 
And another one who seems to have flowered in a sort of strange afterlife is Gordon Brown, who just seems like, again... Oh, he was, but he was a huge figure. He was a Titanic, yeah. you know. You could see him being part of something like Wilson's Kitchen Cabinet, those kind of really yeah. big yeah, personalities. Yeah, yeah. Were already, and then you saw, actually, quite most of the other people during the Belair years, you just thought, I just don't think you'd even be making... Not Mandelson, because he was very clever, but you think, I don't think you'd be making the tea. I mean, these people mm. were just... It, well, I, I just wonder whether quite a, the, a lot of the fault uh, is, the, you know, the Blair system of government, which was, again, that thing of centralising. Yeah, the sofa. The, the, the sofa government, centralising so, power. The sofa of death. Uh, uh, and just wanting to bring in politicians who were fundamentally mid middle managers. And anyone with an iota of personality um, just got squeezed out. I mean, most of them died. Um, I, I'm not saying Blair is responsible for it. <laughs> Don Dewar and Mo Mollum and Robin Cook. And, but uh, but the, all the ones with personalities just slightly got marginalised in the end, just got disillusioned. And, and you were left with people. Do you remember Alan Milburn? Who, you, oh, yeah. I mean, but, see, I see how deathly quiet it went. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just that, that what kind about of. Hazel like, Blair's? Her, her Hazel ray, Blair's. Little Ray of Sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a name from the past. Uh, and it's just that. Sense of, uh, Do you remember of controlling. The, there was one thing that I always find this really moving. Do you remember Estelle Morris, who was Education Secretary? She's great. She mm. said, I've got to resign because I'm just actually not good enough to do this. Yeah, job. I do I remember that. Can you imagine any? <laughs> when and I've that, looked at uh, Sue Ella Braverman or there's Karen, Karen Bradley. That, or uh, when Williamson. Estelle Morris resigned, that was like the, seen as the gold standard of resignation. Yeah. Then. No. Mm. It was the last resignation. Now no, no, the gold standard resignations is Matt Hancock. Yeah. Because he actually... <laughs> hey, he fell he, in love. He fell in love. Is it a crime to fall and in love? And resigned. <laughs> <laughs> but he resigned the moment it happened. You know, the, well, the moment it was posted up on the front pages. But he did go, fair enough. <laughs> you got me. I'm off. You know, and I think that now seems like we, we've kind of cro fro crossed the threshold where I, I do genuinely think that you know, people like Boris Johnson genuinely think we're not that bothered anymore about what our politicians are like. It'll be interesting to see what, in the end, comes of Partygate. I'm going to have to update, because this book was written before, before Partygate, and I'm going to have to update it. Um, uh, because it would be interesting to see whether, actually, we've arrived at something that does force the Prime Minister to resign. Um, I just feel he'll, he, he, will, he will not, he, he definitely wouldn't resign. It's just not in the personality type. And is it because he um, genuinely thinks he hasn't done anything wrong? Or, it, or even is the concept of right and wrong The concept that of right and wrong is head. not even, in, is no, not even that's there. that's not in his head. He just no. couldn't care less. He has no interest. He literally could no. say the rules and say how important it is to follow the rules, go out and turn, go, turn right foot off the curtain and break them. It just right. absolutely no... So, no, I think it's just a sort of pathology. It's just completely... No. But they might... Will they think, well, it's gone on long enough now, we won't do anything about it? I think they think they're going to... That people, it depends how bad it all is, but mm. that people will... That they'll, if they think they'll lose their seats. But they'll lose because of cost of living, so they'll... Yes, yes. But they've got so many ideas about the cost of living that I think... Um, <laughs> They've we got could so burn our books. We could just, um, <laughs> just have you thought of just earning more money? Have you thought of getting a job that, in which you earn more money? I have posted up this. Oh, I forget her name now, but she does a parody of MPs, and she, is she did called Rosie Hull. Rosie She's Hull. Funny, Rosie she? Hull. And she did one yesterday, a parody of the interview where, she, where playing a Tory MP, she said, "Now, I mean, if, for example, you are say a carer." and you feel that you're not earning enough money, then why not become a banker? <laughs> or get yourself um, you know, a, a position on the board of a you know, company, set of company directors. That, I think, is one way where I think we could, should be looking at it. And I posted this up, and underneath it, the comments from people was, was like, God, they're the worst, aren't they? They, just, <laughs> they have a clue. The fact that people could actually believe that that was genuinely a Tory MP, and it people... felt perfectly normal, <laughs> perfectly average, People so constantly think now that sh she might be one. Yes, uh, yes. Including sometimes I've seen another MP get it wrong and a couple of journalists is that they actually feel like, yeah, that feels thereabouts. That's just about, <laughs> feels about where we are morally. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it is good. Just go back to the, the, the thing of it, sorry, the, the thing of it, because the very first episode of, of... We invented stuff in the thick of it, thinking, well, it can't be worse than this. And then about a week after it would go out, 
you get a call from someone in White Hole saying, how did you find that out? You know, and the first, first episode of, of the thinking of it, they're all in the back of a car, and he, he's about to announce a policy, and then he's told by Malcolm the Treasury has shelved it. But I've summoned all the country's press, so they've got 45 minutes in the back of a car to think up a policy that costs no money, that sounds quite good. And I genuinely, because we'd shot the scene, but we were still in the back of a car going to the next location, I said to the cast, well, we've got the cameras, just, just improvise policies in the scene we come up with. Within three or four years of that episode going out, four of their policies had, be had become law. <laughs> had actually become law. And I mean, that... <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's really hard yeah. to stay ahead, given like yeah. you know the time of shooting and editing. Yeah. To stay so yeah, so Chris, it was Chris. Chris. Chris Addison came up with a national spare room database, which was bedroom tax. Yeah. And, and James Smith came up with everyone has to have their own plastic bag permanently. <laughs> and, and, and the other one was pet asbos, which the Blair government brought in duly. <laughs> about a month after the episode went out. And I've had various ex-ministers years later come up to me and say, I've been in the back of that car. You know, it's just, and I just find it frightening. I find it, you know, these are, we, we write these as jokes. We write, we, we think we are consciously and deliberately exaggerating for comic effect. But then to find out that actually we're only just scratching the surface of the, of the commotions going on. Veep, That's the, I mean, that, with Veep and Trump, you would have had such... Well, I'm glad I wasn't you, yeah, doing. You, I'm you glad I wasn't been, doing Veep yeah, during the time of Trump because I think Trump is, you know, he is his own satirist, really. You know, yeah. he, he's a self-basting satirist. <laughs> uh, you know, and, auto, and, is it auto satirical? Auto -satirical. The satire is happening you know, as it's being guy, said. I said it, but I wasn't. I was joking. They don't get it. They're so woke. It was the best joke ever. So good that people don't laugh. It's so out of your register. You don't understand how good I am. I'm the best, the best cop. You know, you will laugh so hard. No one, but I'm serious. I'm a politician, but I'm funny. I, so many people, so many people love me. So many people. So many. That's, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have the same sentence structure, yeah. which is if you analyze anything they say, you'll find there's about five windows open at once. Yeah. Because yeah. You've got, it's, a, it's a desktop. That's right. <laughs> Boris will go, and I say, I, and, and, and let me just tell you that, uh, and, and, I, and I take your, I understand your, your concern, but if I could just, I, because I think it's important, and what I'm looking at, you know, it's already yeah. you've got five starts of sentences. And so, always comes back to, well, actually, I created the bus pass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he couldn't help himself, yeah, like, why yeah, have you yeah. done that? He just, yeah, yeah, yeah. he just... The one thing you mustn't do is look callous in the face of an elderly person begging you, for food and heat. Do you remember you when know? he went to the, Do you remember when he was trying to get the election, after he got, won the Tory leadership, and he was going around the country just going, why won't you give me my election? I want my general election. And, it was, and he went to that police academy in Wakefield, Oh, yes. And there was a poli and they left them standing, all the little trainees, for so long. Yeah. And this woman had a sort of whitey behind him, and she fainted. And it just you've got to know instinctively if you're that guy. I have to look after this woman because I'm a politician, and I'll look awful if I don't do something. Yeah. And he said, "Oh, yeah, I think that's my cue to go." <laughs> and, but then, and it's like, oh no, you've got to turn around. You can imagine the advisor thinking, "Just, turn, just help up. Just say, are you okay?" Yeah. And also, he was having hard questions, so it would have been. On every level, the, it would have been the right thing to do to just mm. help her up and then say, anyway, I can't answer any more of your hard questions. But, wasn't that but the, he didn't know to do it. But wasn't also that speech where he got bogged down trying to remember a, a saying or something about the police? Uh, yeah. I can't remember what it was. I Sorry? The caution. Oh, the, yes. The caution, was the, it? You have the, 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 yeah, you the, have the right... Yeah, he was trying to remember yeah. the wording of what a police caution... I think he knows it by now. <laughs> um, <laughs> <he was> trying, <laughs> um, he was trying to remember, and he, and, and he sort of kind of froze. And he went, you have, I, I mean, it's like the famous, uh, uh, you have the right, what, what is it? The, uh, it's got the ghosts of all these people around him that he asks. What, 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 what is it? Um, uh, you have the, what is it? Uh, 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 it's coming, hang on, forgive me. Forgive Frankie Ball uh, said he was buffering. Buffering, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like slowly, and everyone's in suspense. Your download animation. speed is yeah. not very good. <laughs> he, con he, he constantly looks like totally discombobulated, like the one when he ran into the fridge, or when he, when he took the reporter's phone. Do you remember when he took it and put his yeah. pocket on the phone? <laughs> I can't actually believe he's still here, I mean, but anyway. going through, it, I mean, I, I asked the question, what is going through that mind? But is there anything going through that mind? Or is it, is it kind of like, 
is it just memory muscles? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it just a sort of... You know, He's it, so hollowed out inside. That it's it's like just animatronic, is yeah. that it? But animatronic in, implies some sort of software intelligence, but it's, it's not that. It's a sort of lobotomised animatronic... Just, it's, it's, but he's it's, a man of appetites and impulses. So yes. when he saw the phone, he just had to take it. <laughs> How and do I deal with a tricky just, question from a reporter? I'm just going to take the phone. <laughs> and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of it later. But also, he's always, because he's got that Wallace and Gromit thing where, you know, you're putting the, the tracks as your, as your runaway train is happening. Yeah. So he's always just thinking, what will buy me my next fucking 30 yes. seconds? Yes. And there was this thing that, that he did in the House of Commons, but maybe last, last week, where he said, anyway, and I think you're going to be hearing from me in the, because you're having a difficulty question, I think you'll hear from me in the Chancellor with some emergency measures over the next few days. And people just go, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. There's not an emergency budget. Yeah. I mean, nothing's happening. And then they had to scramble afterwards to brief just like... But, you know, he bought himself, I don't know, 15 seconds of that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is, is that it? So what we are in now, then, is we're, a, we're exactly like anyone who is in a relationship with Boris Johnson is. We're at that point where he's yeah. going, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I have to apologise. And, and then he'll do it again. Yeah. And then he'll go, I don't know why I did that, but I, 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 I am so sorry. Uh, and then he'll do it again. And, we'll do, we're, and then yeah. he'll go, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Are we in that we kind of... have 20 years of it. <laughs> Is that how long people last with him? I think the dwindling... Yes. <laughs> my, my prediction would be dwindling years. <clears throat> dwindling years. So we were meant to talk about the, yeah, um, the power of narrative yes. and storytelling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, go on. Do, do, is it, <laughs> satire. satire. Uh, I, when, I, when I did a thing at The Guardian with John Crace, who's fantastic, mm. when we talked about... I, somebody said, it's great that satire changes things. And I said, oh, no, I, it doesn't change anything doesn't at all. It doesn't change a and thing. And somebody from the... People in the audience were really like upset like I'd said something terrible about no. Father Christmas and I was like I'm really sorry you know it's like thank you for thinking it does but no, it doesn't I mean, it is like the, it was the John Cleese thing about he was a big fan of a lot of the cabaret that went on in, in Weimar Germany in the in the late 20s and early 1930s <coughs> and, and and the magnificent effect it had and it did so much to stop the rise of Adolf yeah, Hitler exactly. you know and, I mean and, you know and the comedy boom happened in the 1980s all throughout the continuing Margaret Thatcher period. So it doesn't... It do, I mean, I, th I think if you write something thinking this will change how yeah. people will vote, I think you're on a hiding to nothing, you know, if it's a comedy. Because, you know, if you want to do that, then go into politics or go into campaigning journalism or go into um, local... Gu you know, lo I mean, but writing com do comedy is not going to change people's political opinions. Whether it... Hopefully, you know, it might allow people to take a fresh look at something. It might I throw up an interesting... It yeah, it might throw up a kind of, you know, people, an unusual people, slant on something. Or, people now say yeah. the whole time... Oh, it's just like they're thick of it. You've, yeah. you, it's like they've seen something rendered and they can see it new for the first time. Yeah. It's, isn't that thing in... Um, I'm trying to think what it's from. Maybe from the critic as artist where Oscar Wilde says... So the sunsets didn't exist before Turner painted them. And, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they didn't happen. And, they, you know, it's like, oh, no, now, yes. I, now I can see this thing. There was no terrible politicians no. before the thing. No, I think, but I think it gives things... Sometimes it, I think the thick of it, the only thing that's inaccurate about the thick of it, there's no scene in the thick of it where somebody says, this is just like a scene from the thick of yeah. it. <laughs> that's the one thing we didn't see, uh, unfortunately. But that yeah. sort of thing, it, it, it comforts... I definitely think it comforts the... Well, they say that worries me. It, no. If it's a comfort... No, to, to the people it's being done to, not to the people right. within. Although, actually, funnily enough, they're, they're, people do misunderstand things like that. People really misunderstand... Michael Lewis wrote that great book. Do you know that book, Liar's Poker, which is oh, about right, yes, being, okay. you know, on Wall Street in the 80s? <laughs> and it was, like, an unbelievably moral book. Also, Brett Easton Ellis wrote American Psycho, which, again, I think is an unbelievably moral book. And a lot of people just completely misunderstood. And lots of people go out to Michael Lewis all the time and say... I went on to Wall Street because of that book. And yeah. he was like, but yes, but, but that's... <laughs> that, okay, you were supposed well, to copy it. Imagine how I feel when I, I meet someone who says, oh, I went into politics because Malcolm, <laughs> Malcolm Tucker is my hero. Oh, no, you know, it's just I've that. just remembered something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. going back to the day-to-day. -day, okay? Right, okay. Okay, 
question time live from Wembley Stadium in the referendum they said it's quest question question time live from Wembley and I just yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not supposed to do it <laughs> it's a joke yes it's, yes I got, that, I got, that and that's the thing happened. that worries me so we stopped doing the thing of it when they started quoting the thing of it in the speeches and yeah. uh, Ed Miliband called Osborne's budget best and, and Ovna Shambles budget and Cameron had a go at Jeremy Corbyn and saying it's like an episode of the thick of it. And I thought, okay, it, it, you know, it, yeah. <laughs> it hasn't achieved its required effect, <laughs> <laughs> which is to radically improve politics across the board. Um, they've, they've uh, but I think that is, and I do sometimes wonder, I mean, it's a question I ask myself, almost like being devil's advocate. You know, we have this tradition in the UK of, of, of satire and, and, you know, we've talked about Alexander Pope and Swift and, and, and so on. Uh, and we don't have revolutions. We don't really have, you know, big riots. We have some riots, but we don't have... Whereas, you know, in France, yeah. they have protests and riots. Yeah. I don't know what their satire is like. And I just wonder whether, actually... I mean, the biggest riot we had was, was when we all assembled outside Buckingham Palace saying they should raise the flag because Diana had died. <laughs> that was the biggest... That was a big, polite, but firm riot that, that, that went across the board. But, but I, so I do wonder whether actually the fact that we are so keen to tell jokes about authority and uh, is that actually preventing us from actually, from actually getting down and dirty and, and actually trying to change yeah, stuff? People I always that as a, kind of, as a kind of a hypothetical, but I don't genuinely know the answer to that, but it is something I <coughs> keep asking myself. People, if you think of people always hold Swift up as the absolute sort of ideal, and yeah. then he writes a, mod a modest proposal which... I don't know if you've all read, but he it suggests that oh, perhaps the you know the poor could eat their babies, yes. and and then that way you know it would deal with the population problem and also with this hunger problem. Yeah. And you know nothing happens, and then they have the Irish famine four years later. Exactly. So yes. Nothing really. And yes. sometimes it's something. But it wouldn't could... surprise me if a Tory minister now went on the television and, and actually said, and actually said, you know, now a lot of you, some of you might not like this, but <laughs> that Lee Ashford didn't say anything. This will kill two birds with Lincoln one stone. 30, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I do, I do wonder whether you know, in a way, a uh, big satirical tradition acts as a kind of pressure valve, you know, a safety valve. Yeah. On our kind of somebody said that doesn't yeah. it? That there's a every joke is a revolution that doesn't happen or something. Right. There's, yeah. there's some line yes. about I can't remember who said it though. So yeah. sorry, that's not very literary. Just say it? you said it. Just, just, just <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Nobody knows. Snick it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. Yeah, so I yes, I think there's uh, there is something. Said. I always think that uh, Americans they don't have that their big tradition. Of, they don't have no. such a tradition of like sketch writing and all of that. No, which is such a waste. What is interesting in America now is that the, the people who sort of did land punches on Trump, yeah. I think, were strangely comedians who became journalists, you know, in the same way that Trump became the entertainer, the big... Like know, John Oliver. John Oliver, yeah. who have teams of researchers. So and, and so their take was, OK, you know, he thinks he can say anything and get away with it, but let's take you through some of the things that either ha how he has said or that have happened. We'll arrange them in, in a sort of funny way, yeah. but fundamentally they're a presentation of facts. So, so they've become almost like, <laughs> the jokes have become factual. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, late it, night is a sort of news... Uh, out, yeah, people uh, get their news. news. People yeah. get their news from John Oliver and the late night. Another thing, though, I do think about that, which is mm. I sometimes think... I was reading a book about um, David Letterman, who's obviously their kind of Bigfoot in some ways because he was so sort of iconic for a whole generation yeah. of those people. But you get the sense that when Letterman's doing his show you know, people who vote both ways are watching it. Yes. And yes. I just feel now that in some ways that kind of satire has become so siloed that, yes. you know, it's impossible really to imagine anyone who yes. goes to the other side watching it, it, John Oliver, even though I think John Oliver is actually Exactly, it has amazing. become siloed, uh, with the preponderance being yeah. you know, comedians on, on the left, just because I can't imagine how jokes on the right would work, because, because fundamentally, if you're... Con he is the biggest <laughs> if you are right wing, you you want things to be preserved and revered rather than undermined and and challenged. Yeah, that's a, a massive generalisation. I can't say that, <laughs> but fundamentally, you want to you, conserve. You know, when the um, the Nadine Doris of this world, which is Nadine Doris, <laughs> say, say why are all comedians left wing? It's not all comedians are left wing. It just it so happens that, you know, comedy is about it, twisting the truth and exaggerating and, and, and 
and actually literally being unfair. I mean, a joke is about being unfair. It's about stretching something yeah. to breaking point. You know, it's about, it's about coming up with stuff rather than just stating facts. Um, and I think that is a kind of typically slightly more subversive type of behaviour, which happens to coincide a lot with how um, voices on, on, the, on the left or the centre-left work. You know, that, that, that's, again, that's a very broad explanation, very simply. But I think that's why that happens and why it's very... You do get lots of people on the right who say terrible things and then when there's outrage just say, I was only joking. But it's just they're not very good jokes. Because but they try to shut... I do think they, they don't try to shut down jokes as much as now people on mm. the left to some extent yeah. do. I think that the, there's much more of a... You know, there's more of a... The policing who, who don't side... Try, who don't try to shut down People on the jokes. right people will take it better, in my... Right. Oh, you're... <laughs> well, in, that's another thing that people have stopped... Well, except if you happen to be the culture secretary and just say, I don't, I'll just shut down the networks. That's yeah, what I'll do. Yeah. The, the ones that, you know, I'll just... I talked to Ian Hislop about this once, and he said that it was really... He, they'd noticed a whole new thing at Private Eye, which is that people had always, you know, taken it on both sides mm -hmm. for the, with the magazine. And then suddenly there were people coming through saying, well, you know, I, I'm actually... They, the first people they noticed cancelling their subscriptions were the Scottish Nationalists saying, you know, I've always liked your magazine, but I don't actually like what you're doing now about this, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to cancel my subscription. And then actually sort of Brexit tears came through, and then um, Corb Corb mm -hmm. Corbynites came through saying... I used to, I used to like this, but I don't like it anymore because it's about sort of effectively yes. because it's about my team. Yes. and that I think is a much. I think that happens more. <laughs> that happens more. I think, I think that, more. and that's become a more worrying thing because yeah. it, you know, I, I, I don't feel it, but I know maybe younger comedians do. They they worry about what the their joke they're writing might be and whether someone might be upset by it. I mean, I, I've had a very good relationship with my Twitter um, followers. But the only time I get anything that's towards abusive is from from um, Scottish nationalists or or from Jeremy Corbyn supporters because I once or twice tweeted that his position on anti-Semitism could do with a bit of improving, really. <laughs> and um, to this day, I still get you know if I say how terrible um, you know the government is on poverty, I get tweets on like well. All because of you, you know. But, yeah. You you chose them, not me. No, Sasa you know, does nothing. We just want to choose the Tory yeah. government. You know, and I, I did get one saying, you know, you had to go at uh, Jeremy Corbyn for for you know accusations of anti-Semitism, yeah. but you've let in this Tory government. Children are dying under that. You would actually prefer the death of children than if the matter of on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was resolved. I, I thought, no, that's a very... No, that's a bit of a leap. <laughs> I don't quite... I can't remember saying any of those words. I got... Uh, OK, last <laughs> week I, I wrote an incredibly facetious joke about and I, at saying, right at the end of a... About, uh, just, just as a way to get off stage, basically, saying, <laughs> arguing on the internet is like playing real tennis. Even if you win, you're still a twat, OK? <laughs> it's, it's the last, you know... It, yep. we're, uh, and good night. And <laughs> anyway, and this person, this guy with who's from the Real, Real Tennis Association, of course, <laughs> of course, wrote a letter to the Guardian yeah. saying, "I've always enjoyed this Reader's Highest column. Imagine my sho shock to discover this slur <laughs> against Real Tennis." And I was like, "Okay, it's a facetious <laughs> joke, and maybe." A shit one, but it is not a slur. We know what slur slur to me is like a, mm. and I just thought, well, how can that joke oh, about real tennis? It is a slur. You're implying that people who are playing real tennis are twat. I mean, just play but, action tennis. Sorry, but anyway, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into tennis. But I just but thought, my, but my, my point is, is so like, no. But my point is though, yes, it is a slur. And so what? And so, you know, what? so yeah. what? What's wrong with being offended? But I really feel like ten years ago, no one would have referred to a joke about real tennis as a slur. Yes, I because can. I mean, a slur. We knew what slurs were, and they were the really bad things. Imagine you walk up with lots of real tennis players outside your house, just chanting. <laughs> After this, if anyone's watching, can I just say <laughs> I'm attracted? But I do. I do rackets. I'll get onto that <laughs> one. But I do think it's it's important that you know we should be offended at yeah. things. Um, because it's important that our beliefs are tested. You know, if, if you have a set of opinions and they can't take a joke, then how, you know, have you really, how strongly are you holding on to those opinions? If, you know, if, 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 if they start falling apart at the first yeah, kind of little prod. Um, and, and I think what we've kind of lost is that sense of challenging each other and, 
and being happy to hear um, a, a, an opposing point of view. It might get you annoyed, it might get you angry, but then you should feel you should be able to argue your, yeah. or your be bit funny against back. it, or be funny back, or, or whatever. It's that so there is a sense thing of, again. Because it's you're, never going to, you're never going to change people's minds if you're only speaking to the people who agree with you. The only way you're going to change people's minds is if you speak to people who slightly disagree with you, maybe very yeah. much disagree, you know, but th that's how you're going to enlarge, and any political party, that's how they're going to enlarge their support, that's how they're going to enlarge their base. And I think that is, I think the worrying thing that's happening in politics now is that more and more politicians feel they have to speak to their base, which yeah. is fair enough. They've got to, you know, they've got to get them, the loyal supporters out and, and voting and voting enthusiastically. But then what? You know, you've then, how do you grow? And the only way you grow is by approaching members of the electorate who didn't vote yeah. for you last time. And try and tell and, a unifying and, story and for everyone. It's not everybody. like you have to change all your beliefs in order to make them happy, but it's to at least try and find out what was the motivation for why they didn't vote. What are the concerns that they feel you or your predecessor wasn't addressing, and therefore you might find, I'm sorry, I can't help you. We are just going to have to disagree. But you might also find something that makes them think, okay, yeah, might not work. I'll give it a go. I don't know. But you're, yeah. you're certainly not going to... And, and the other thing that's happening is, of course, you get people like, especially in the Republican Party in America, who recognise this, who know this, that it's actually not about expanding your base. It's just now about stopping the others from voting. Yeah. You know, yeah. You've expanded your base as much as you can. There's no way you're going to get anyone else to believe in QAnon and <laughs> the, the, the election was stolen. You know, you've got all of them. So it's now about stopping all of them. You know, and that's what does worry me about things like the fact that they've just voted through last week that next election we're all going to have ID, we're yeah, going to show proof of ID because of this terrible voter fraud. That hasn't been going on at all. Um, uh, or things like, you know, I mentioned Channel 4. The government said, no, 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 we're going to have an, a, a consultation with the industry first about thoughts about what we do with Channel 4. They had the consultation. <sighs> The 97% of the industry said this is a bad idea. So they said, yeah, but we're going to go ahead with it anyway. And that it's, it's those stages where actually now it's not about worrying about the opposition or worrying about dissent. Um, because we've, we've come up with a system now where that doesn't even enter into the conversation. People yeah. with dissenting opinions are just no longer valid. Um, we've limited it to those who agree with us or, or who we think will agree. That's, that's, that's for me, the, the, the worry in terms of where we are now. Um, although B Boris Johnson is incredibly funny, um, he could also spell the end of democracy in the worst. <laughs> so, <laughs> discuss. Five minutes to a question. Five minutes to a question. Five so you've now got five minutes to think of yeah. the response to that statement. Yeah. Yes, so... <laughs> But uh, yes, and I do think that there's a two. Well, then I, it worries me slightly that the left still now preaches too much to its already it's diverse, so, yes. and that they're going again. They have to reach out beyond and f find a way to tell a story that involves both both sides of people. I don't think I can't see any side of that we're getting any closer <laughs> to it. I know. I mean, it's 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 almost like. Um, What's that? Is it entropy? When things just get worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's entropy, isn't it? Yeah. I think that may be, you know, where politics is. In that it, it, you know, it, it, you know, after the, especially after the Second World War, there's this ideal United Nations yeah. and freedom, democracy, whatever, and that was the kind of high point. And then, and then it just sank and 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 just, you know, that, you know, unless we all start to kind of, you know, reawakening ourselves to. I mean, that's part of the reason I made the death of Stalin, because I, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, democracy isn't permanent. You know? Yeah. Uh, it, it's only permanent if you keep committing to it, keep renewing it. But if you just think, ah, take it or leave it, me, then that's what happens. You know, it, there's a vacuum. That's the problem. With these part, you know, the political bodies that, that move apart and don't talk to each other, you end up with a vacuum, and vacuums are very dangerous, because that's when you know, chances and personalities kind of yeah. looping and going, hey, I'm different. Why don't you give me a go? You know? And then... And then oh, like, like in... Um, um, uh, uh, it, it's in the Philippines, haven't they? They just elected... Marcus's son, yeah. Yeah. 
I'm different. I'm a Marcus. Give me a go. Yeah. You know, what could possibly go wrong? You know, they it's had one picture of seeing the mother, and they were like, "Oh my God, that is that Picasso." So they just, yeah. the, just <laughs> on the, on the, on the oh, wall, all the stuff you've raided yeah. from the country. Oh, I see. There's the missing yeah. Picasso. It's still just in your house. Just yeah. One one moment of footage, and they've already found. Yeah. 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 But he now has the control of the investigation, so... Yes. I think we'll be finding any more Picassos anytime soon. Well, it's like Boris Johnson ultimately will decide whether any action should be taken over the conclusions of the Sue Gray report. Because yeah. he's the Prime Minister. <laughs> he gets to decide. I mean, that's, that's, that's where we are. And, and, and Britain does have... The, because we have an unwritten constitution, we, we have this system in which the, the, any Prime Minister with a large majority has... Complete power. There is no. There are no checks and balances. I mean, even an American president, as we yeah. can see, you know, can't get legislation through. <laughs> I'm all for writing with... this constitution down now. I think, I think tried, so. I think we've. I think they kind of we've been winging it for the last three hundred years, and it's been great up till now. I think that doesn't work. But, but it work, yeah, with these with these type of um, like actors, in the sense of it, it doesn't. It, it's not set up for people who just think. I just want to be prime minister, and then I'm good. And if I yes. don't, yeah, it's not set up for these types of. Well, it's when the likes it's a good faith system. Exactly, exactly. It's and, when the, the likes of people like Johnson come in, you realise how much of our kind of public life is really dependent on a set of kind of unwritten but understood rules where people will be yeah. fundamentally fair and decent and will do the decent thing. And we passed decent <laughs> really some passed towns decent. ago now. <laughs> We're not going back to decent. So, no, no. yeah, I'm all for writing it down now. We're, we're now in, yeah, we, de decent, yeah, that. Yeah. We're now in bleak. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Fantastic. Well, questions. Um, I will start with some questions from our online audience, and then if uh, people in our in person audience want to put up their hands, we'll bring around a microphone. Uh, but to start off with, there's a question from Andy, and it's a question for both of you. Mm -hmm. He would like to know Armando, what is your favourite or most memorable piece of Marina's writing? And Marina, <laughs> what is your favourite uh, yeah, piece of Armando? Well, the thing that got me, uh, made me sit up and take notice of Marina was I think you were doing all the party conferences about. It has my lot in... About four life. years ago. And, yeah. and there were these double-page kind of... Uh, and they were just hysterical from start <laughs> to finish. But also... But, it, it, but you, you, you have the ability to be hysterical from start to finish, and, and every line is an amazing one line that any other writer would be envious of. But there is an argument, which is great. You know, there is, there is a kind of... You know, <laughs> there is anger there. There is, yeah. a, there is a kind of... You can sense the emotion behind it as well. I never know it before I've... As far as still writing it, yeah. where it's going. But, but do you feel it when you're writing it? Yes, do you? It, yes. It, I, yes. It, it's a way of working through. It's actually quite cathartic in right. some ways. Yeah. After the absolute horror show of the last few years has been yeah. quite. It's actually writing about it has been strangely calming. Right. Because you well, I don't have unresolved news issues which other people around, <laughs> around me do have. But like you know, the day after Brexit or something. I mean, can you do? Are you? Do you find yourself able to write, or, or oh my god, yeah, an all night and standing on the mm -hmm. standing on College Green with uh, outside of Westminster with Nigel Farage, who just conceded, non-conceded, and un unconceded, done it again at his victory party, and then stood there saying, "We've done all this without a shot being fired," and it was just like, yeah. "Oh my god," yeah. you know, Joe Cox had been killed a week before. It yes. was just, yeah. and it was like five a.m. Mm -hmm. Like really cold light. You've been up all night. I was just thinking, oh god, yeah, but yeah, you have to write it in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, my favorite of our man is God. That it's so hard. I hate ranking things. I really find it very, very difficult. I was probably have to say V, but it's very because oh, right. I love Julia so much. But it's very, yes, very, right. very yes. difficult. Yes. I, that's difficult. Um, perhaps I'll just carry on then. On, on that note, Alison would like to know if uh, either of you have a favourite satirical comedy character or performance. Uh, of someone else? or uh... Yes, yeah, just from, from literature, from TV, from film. Well, I, you know, I'm a huge Charles Dickens fan, you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of Dickens is really very, very funny. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it, I mean, it gets more and more dark and the, the humour as, as the, in the later novels. One of the reasons I wanted to do the David Copperfield movie was because it's it's actually a funny book as well as a moving book and a uh, a great story uh, and the characters are so amazing. It's actually very funny and um, 
And so at a very, quite an early age, I was into Dickens when about 13, 14, I was just struck by how modern he felt and how, you know, how funny a writer he was, really. So that's always been... And then that he could take that ability to do funny stuff, but put it on a big public stage yeah. and actually talk about tough issues for a Victorian reading public, yeah. about child labour and crime and punishment. And, you know, and The Little Dorrit, it's an amazing story about how everyone is just obsessed with the banks and money and then the bank collapses and debt and you know it's it's I mean it's incredible oh, my, my favorite satirical character um gosh I'll tell you what I'm gonna just this I as I get say I hate rank, ranking this but I just reread Cole Comfort Farm and I just think that is one of the I was laughing I was laughing out loud throughout the whole thing which I, I really rarely do and it was really annoying to my husband in bed <laughs> but it was I, I thought it was it was so unbelievably funny and so racy and so everything for the age that I couldn't believe a woman had written that in in that era I was stunned at how kind of wickedly naughty it was and what an incredible I, I think it's it's miles funnier than I remembered. Sorry, it's just fresh in my mind, so I wanted to say that. Could we buy and reread. <laughs> oh, question over there. Or? Oh, there's a mic just behind you. Yeah. Um, it's um, a question for both of you, and then one specific one for um, you, Amanda. Um, how important is swearing in satire <laughs> and modern satire? And in the list of all the great things you've said, where does Thomas the Wank Engine fit? <laughs> right. Do the last one first, just to, <laughs> just to explain. Um, so I was going on The Last Leg, which is a really good show, The Last Leg. I mean, there's something that's on a Friday night, Channel 4, you'd think it'd be all be jokes about, you know, celebs and stuff. It's not. It, it, they really want to talk about politics, and but be funny. And, and, and so I was invited on, and I, I, I hadn't realised he'd he got a series of buttons that he presses that says something like bullshit and whatever, just to call it. And he asked me to re-record them on the night I was on. So I came up with, you know, whatever. You know, a turd the size of Disneyland Paris and Thomas the Wank Engine. And I just recorded them that night thinking, but they've been using them for the last four series. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm just walking, so I'm just walking down the street and I just see, and somebody just goes, Thomas the Wank Engine. <laughs> and I think to people around me who don't know what that person is talking about, yeah. just think, <laughs> I'm just being abused. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it just shows you the. Uh, you need a sandwich board disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a one off. It's not, <laughs> it's not me. It's the, that is not who I am. <laughs> Um, and, and the previous quote with the importance of swearing. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it, I mean I'm mean, i not really a swearer as such, but no. I just think when we were doing the research mm. for the thick of it, it was very much a very macho, testosterone-fueled yeah. environment, and it was all, fuck this, fuck that. And we did think, we'll have to reflect that in, you know, because I wanted to show the freneticism and the kind of stress, the fact that they were genuinely... <laughs> making it up as they went along because they didn't have time to come up. But I just thought saying the same word again and again, it's just going to get boring. So it's all about trying to... I need an artiste. Uh, well, and you found... Well, it's oh, Ian Martin, our swearing consultant. <laughs> um, uh, he's not. He's, he's fantastic. But he's so he, much more than a swearing he's consultant. He's more than a swearing consultant. <laughs> but he's an but, incredible but swearing consultant. What we thought is, if we're going to swear, then it's the, it's the words around the swearing, yeah. you know, so it's which are usually expressions of physical violence yeah. or whatever around the swearing. So it's not... Uh, uh, and, and then it reached a sort of level of poetry where, you know, I think it was Tony Roach who came, with, came up with uh, Come the Fuck In or Fuck the Fuck Off, which is, <laughs> you know... They now say in children's playgrounds, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> was Fuckety Bye one of yours? Fuckety Bye, I think that was one of mine. Yeah, yes, yeah, I think that was in, that was in, in the look, Fuckety Bye, um, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, Billy Conley has this whole routine about how the word fuck can mean so yeah, many things, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, like poetry. I mean, poetry is all about words that are doing three or four jobs at once, really. And, <coughs> and the English are, are great. Yeah, right back to Chaucer. And We're in the Scott, Chaucer room Scottish here. As well, this was where he wrote yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Canterbury Tales, this, yeah. this very room. Um, <laughs> But he's full of kind of sweary yeah. words and stuff like that. Yeah, no. yeah, people, yeah. Yeah, English 
literature, literature kind of loves, for, uh, yeah, loves for, kind of, has yeah. A, yeah has an, an, an a surprising amount of it in it. And I mean, the... Swift is, my God, it's just completely scatological. And right. I was, yeah, that's, it, that can get a bit much. Although sometimes when you're, God, I mean, I, I've, there have been times over the last, you know, four or five years writing about, and I was reading, rereading Swift sometimes and just thinking, I can see just the, you know, a compulsion to just make it all just a tide of shit <laughs> because you'd watch like four nights on the bounce of like something called indicative votes and just yeah, think yeah, like yeah, oh. yeah. actually there was a guy who stood up in the House of Commons called Steve Double who Steve stood Double? Up, Steve Double is his name he's a Tory back veteran he stood <laughs> up in the Double. House of Co Commons okay. and he said and he literally said in the House of Commons who's this speak this is a turd of a deal but it might just be the best turd that we've got. <laughs> With Theresa May just looking round at him like that. The, it, it descended into actual... It became Swift in itself. So you can say that and not be asked to leave, but yeah. if you call Boris Johnson a liar, you have to... It's so Christy, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I can't stand yes. that little rule. <laughs> right. Have we answered all your... Oh, no, go on. We'll do general knowledge as well, if, <laughs> if it comes to that. Uh, this is a very, sorry, political rather than literature question, but I was just wondering what you guys think, because I'm very much in, hopefully, your sort of more centrist realm of politics, and um, coming from Canada, and I've lived here now for 15 years, and it's so terrifyingly right-wing um, dominant, and obviously, like every MP you've mentioned tonight, I'm just wondering, do you think there could be any realistic movement to actually galvanize enough of what I'm assuming most of the room is quite centrist, <laughs> into, into a better realm and a better future for this country and its politics? Well, that's a big question. Uh, I think if you look at lots of the polling now, yes. lots of the issues that, you know, actually things that, no matter how much they make a thing, Im immigration is really decreasing in people as an issue in terms of what people are obsessed yes. with. Lots of things are cleaving back to some kind of centre. The way people talk about all sorts of things. What's been so deceptive, and like what the, one of the worst things that I think ever happened was like pundit television, where, you know when they used to cast a reality TV house at the like in the early 2000s, they'd, they'd want conflict. And then the news became like this, and they'd say, we'll have someone right from this far end of the spectrum, and then someone's the other end. And then they can just have a fight, and that will be content, mm -hmm. and it will be drama. And it's it actually created this illusion of a much more polarised mm. country. It's actually, there's much more agreement on, if you really kind of look into the polling, on quite a lot of things. And it's just the way it's portrayed. That That's right. And, the it, and also, you know, I, I, I don't know what the parliamentary system, voting system is in, in Canada. But here, of course, with the first past the post, you, 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 you get, you know, a, a, a conservative majority of 80 on the back of, uh, you know, 43% of the electorate, probably less, voting. Whereas, you know, if you add the numbers of people who vote Green, Labour, uh, Lib Dem... Just can't whatever, bring themselves to it's, vote. It's, <laughs> there is a, I think there is a, a kind of more um, progressive majority there, but the voting system at the moment doesn't, you know... But I, I, I unfortunately think it's the beyond the wit of all those parties to agree... To just get through the next election, but promising to change the electoral system once they get in. I, I don't. I don't. They're ever going to do that, really. Um, yeah, it's just so we not may be set stuck up for, to, for the people. Who, it's yeah. not set up for that to play out. I don't think. Yeah. I think what is interesting. We haven't it, hit our rock bottom yet. Is the number of people who are now committed to single issue politics, uh, community politics, um, which is great, but it it mustn't then make us think, and therefore we mustn't participate in national politics. Because if you, if you don't vote, then actually, uh, as I say, where there's a vacuum, you know, that's, that's where trouble starts. Really. Did I take this? I don't know what I wonder if you could give me a two-minute guide about how to write to my dreadful MP. <laughs> That's a great question. It's a fantastic. It's a fantastic question. Who is the dreadful MP? <laughs> My well, mother always refers to their MP, who they seem to write quite frequently to, to, as our idiot. But I don't think he's addressed as dear our idiot. 
Um, do you want your dreadful MP to actually um, do something about something locally, or do you just want to let him or her know that about they're, a national they're, issue? So they're a ter they are a dreadful MP. I have no expectation of it. Right. <laughs> Because it may be if you want something to happen, the words you mustn't start with are dear dreadful MP, because <laughs> that will probably, they probably wouldn't read much further than that. They do really care. Can I just say, they mm. do massively care about their inboxes. It's surprising and people just don't realise, yeah. you know, it, it's actually quite touching and quite... I don't know, I find it quite moving that there is still that way of... They do really care what they receive. Uh, often what people make the mistake is they cut and paste something that lots of, you know, is doing a round robin, yeah. Yeah. and then they can see that. But if you take the time, then people think, gosh, someone has actually taken... It, but it does a, make a, a difference as well in that, you know, when they go back to their constituency at the weekend, and if their inboxes are full of, for example, Dominic Cummings, what was all that about yeah. driving up to, you know, Bradford yeah. to test his eyes... This is this is all terrible. That was the message they then brought back the next week to to Westminster. That actually, they read you know, it all, and they really, they they really do read it all. I and, do know and, that and from many many MPs. And therefore, saying to someone, write your MP is not, um, on, on, it's not no, a waste it's, of time. It's not at all a waste of time. Letters they receive on a subject, the more they realise that actually their constituencies, that, you know how important it is to their constituencies. I they are incapable, really are. Uh, in many cases, of independent moral thought. So, you know, <laughs> bear in mind that you are functioning as his kind of Jiminy Cricket or her, might be a lady. <laughs> <laughs> and that was roughly two minutes, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> Um, I might just ask another oh, question from our online audience. Yes. While we're on the topic of writing tips, uh, do you have any writing tips for someone starting out in satirical comedy and how would you advise starting on the research process? Well, uh, I mean, the thing that I always say to people if they want to write comedy is, is write. You know, don't wait. Don't, you know, don't wait for the phone call or the whatever. Um, you know, when I started, I started as a radio producer and it, you know, on weekending, I don't know if anyone... Yeah. Well, it was um, I was one of the last ones, you know, before to kill it off. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, in those days, you typed a script and you posted it in, in the hope that a producer your lines would, get used would read yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, you know. Or on the Thursday, there was a meeting called the Non-Commissioned Writers Meeting where anyone yeah. could come in and, um, you know, pitch ideas, you know. But it was in London, so you had to be able to come to London. Uh, and, and you had to be free on that day. So therefore, you were, you know, mostly unemployed people coming in for cups of tea and a few gags. But now isn't but, it great how you can see all these now, people on social media and, like, this, you know, these people doing these little clips? Like, exactly. Say, you know. But no, you don't have to wait for that moment, yeah. you know? You don't have... You can do it anywhere and you can just start uh, because the more you write, the better you'll get... You know, it, you, you'll write something, you'll think it's terrible, but then ask yourself, well, why is it terrible? What's terrible about it? OK, well, I'm yeah. going to write something else now and try not to do that. Oh, I learned from doing this that that should be... OK, I'll try that in the next one. Because the more, the more you write, the better. And the other thing is to always write what makes you, you laugh, not what you think will make the head of comedy at yeah. Channel 4 laugh. Or, because they'll be gone in six months' yeah. time. <laughs> There'll be someone new... You know, and, and or what the head of the BBC comedy department, you know, because then you're not writing your best stuff because you're not writing with with passion and fit. You're, you're writing with calculation and that's never going to be as funny. I always say to people to write short things. Yes. There's so much long form whatever at the moment and it's, sometimes it's not long form, it's just long and it's too long and writing a little bit, even if it's 100 words every day, yes. it's just, that's the that will get your muscle mm. going and you will... And learning to write tightly is so much more important and not just, than writing it. You know, a you long can go out and record stuff. You know, you don't yeah. have to write. You know, yeah. you can perform it. You could be like Rosie Holt yeah. doing these little one Lots minute of the people Tory are doing MP. One you know, yeah. uh, and that's great. So, so all the all the tools are that now there. You don't have to wait to be asked. Um, that of course means that you know there are more people doing it, and therefore you know you, you've got a lot to kind of um, be measured against. But I'm always a believer that, you know, the good will rise, you know, the good yeah. stuff. I mean, Ian Martin, our, um, more than a swearing consultant, 
I just somebody sent me a link to a website he did. He was ba he's based up in, yeah. in Lancaster, and he and his brother did this funny website, and it was like a spoof of parliamentary reports and tabloid news. And it just made me laugh. I had no idea who he was or, or what he was, and I just got in touch with him and said, you're funny, do you want to write? And we were doing the, the, the first episode of Think of It, and I said to Ian, just, here's the script, just add any bits and pieces. And the script would come back, and he'd add his bits in red. So we were always on set just looking for like the red bits yeah. that Ian had sent in that morning. And the very opening scene, I think Malcolm's on the phone saying, he, in the script he says he's useless. He's absolutely useless. To which Ian added, he's as useless as a marzipan dildo. You know? <laughs> and so, he told me that when he wrote that, he, d he, he was so nervous, this script had come, and he just thought, oh, this is so good, I can't add anything. I just put marzipan dildo. <laughs> and then he thought, the thing everyone remembers. <laughs> so, you know, he, but he was really nervous and felt like he was sort of, yeah. you know, despoiling someone's brilliant writing. <laughs> yeah. and he didn't, but in fact, it was absolutely... Yeah, yeah. To, ha to think that... To not be worried that you're sort of stepping on someone's toes, yes. I think, is, it's so I think easy to be intimidated, I think, I think you've I just got to go for it. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps then relatedly, so that was a question from James, and then Andy uh, would like us to know he's listening to this event while editing PowerPoint slides for his employer, which is an activity <laughs> which always completely eats into his time for writing. What do the two of you tell yourselves about the importance of putting pen to paper, and how do you defend that vital writing time? Oh, heavens, that is a tough one. I mean, I, 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 we were talking about how you can do your column in, like, two hours. Uh, what? Yeah, yes, but I get up really, uh, but also it really helps having a deadline that someone's going to go, where is it if it hasn't? Deadlines are good. Even self-imposed deadlines, yeah. even if you can create artificial deadlines, I think that's better. Otherwise, you just keep putting uh, it off and I, treat yes. it like a diary. Deadlines for me are what makes yeah. things happen. Yes. Generally. I mean, I've got an unfinished novel that I started about 12 years ago because it's very difficult to give yourself a novel deadline. You know, to, well, as we've done by next week, you can't write a novel in a week. So, um... But um, the, the best thing for me has been deadlines and having loads of them. I used to even do a diary column where I used to write every day. And, and even though you're writing short bits, it doesn't matter. It's the every day mm. of it that is the... It, it, that, that's making yourself do a little bit, but also um, just create a fake deadline. Just so I'm going to have to do... And I think it's that also just losing that fear of the blank yeah. page or the blank Word document or whatever. Just that... Just put something down. It might be terrible, but at least you've started. I, yeah, I always know. say to people that writing journalism and things like that, try, mm. think of it as a trade, not an art. Yes. Oh, and anything should be, th even mm. comedy should be sort of, if, you, doing, if you're lucky, it becomes a work of art. But when, actually... When, when we're doing, think of it, and, and I, you, know, you write on an Avenue 5, the first thing I will say for the first draft is do it quickly. Yeah. Because we're going to change it, we're going to, you know... So don't sweat over every line and every phrase, but at least... Once you've done a first draft, it be starts becoming real. It becomes the episode or the script. And then, okay, right, I really like this bit. Let's do more yeah. of this. Not sure the first scenes we need. You don't know, you know what you, you know. It's no, fine not to tell. know what you want. No. You don't know what you want no, and, and you get closer until each you've time. you've got it, you know. So I always, yes, it's, so it's about losing that fear of the, of the blank page. Really. Even if it's just nonsense, just start writing. Yeah, <laughs> and then overwrite nonsense. it. Just arbitrary yeah. words, just to get something down, <laughs> you know, to feel you've started. <clears throat> so we've got five minutes for general knowledge now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing, oh yes, and I was going to say, I think I'm going to be outside um, doing signing, signing. signing these once we're done. Um, when you talked earlier about the potential death of democracy, mm -hmm. um, perhaps you were referring to the photo ID um, requirement that's coming up. I'm wondering how, in both your respective lines of work, you can perhaps bring this to a wider audience. Mm. I mean, I've tweeted about it, but... <laughs> uh. I've written quite a lot. We've done quite a lot of this in The Guardian, and um, it's... People, it's quite hard to explain that we it, it's a solution to a problem that doesn't exist because I think there was like one incident of a vote for in the last election. And if they're, uh, it's costing a fortune as well. Yeah. Just it, it's costing yeah. a fortune and it's, 
there's no good can come of it. But they had all that stuff on that page in that Anna oh. I can't even remember what the page was. It was mm. like they put all this horrible stuff on one page. Oh, in their manifesto. Yeah, yeah no, there's a very sinister paragraph in the Tory 19... Uh, what, when was the last? 20, 2019 election. Um, where it just said, we will also be taking a look at Parliament, the judiciary system, yeah. the electoral system, the yeah. broadcasting system, and how it can be improved and changed. And that was... That yeah. was it, you know. Yeah. And it was just this... And I, I remember reposting that again and again all the way up to the election. Because I was going, what yeah. is this? What is this? It's the only you thing know. they've actually done. <laughs> it's the only thing they've actually done. It's yeah. yeah. It's the... Um, yeah, so, I mean, we, we try and focus on it as much as we have... Each, uh, with each new piece, we try and... Mm. I, I'm, I'm also thinking about how, in your work, you could potentially encourage the likely disenfranchised to do something about it. it people often don't know they're disenfranchised in, in, in the case of voters' abortion until they I turn up the polling I, station. I think the sad thing is we, people won't be aware of it until, whatever, 2023. It's too, it's, until it's know, too late. Where they turn up and are told, no, you can't vote, you haven't yeah. shown us any, you know. Because it hasn't been that widely reported yet. I mean, it's been reported in various newspapers. So. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm amazed there isn't coverage of it on, you know, the BBC News or on Newsnet or on Channel 4 News. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's seen as one of these weird fringe policy manoeuvres, but it... it will have such a profound yeah. impact on the next election. And I don't know why, you know, the opposition parties aren't getting energised about it as well, because it's going to stop a lot of their kind yeah. of core support from, from voting. So I, just, I don't understand, is, 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 the, is the answer. I don't understand why um, opposition parties find certain area uh, maybe the fright that it's too obscure or too wherever but surely among them somewhere there must be someone who can outline in a kind of <laughs> graphic and, and uh, easy to understand way the, the impact it'll have you know um so uh, you know, i mean sadly we can bang on about yes. it all the time but <clears throat> the audience we bang on about it to are not the ones who are going to be affected already by, agree think, yeah <laughs> already agree yes yeah. Well, there we are. We've all the whole thing to be resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for being so generous, Armando and Marina tonight. Um, for free tickets to events and to tonight's event. Um, Sorry, not tonight's event. That's <laughs> over. And, uh, I don't think you can get it back again, ever again. It's, that's it. Um, so for free um, tickets for other events, um, may maybe we can't surpass this event tonight. But anyway, we can give it a shot. So if you want to try um, to come to other events at the RSL, you come uh, a member or acquire a digital events pass. Uh, our membership and passes are open to anyone and start at just a measly £25, that's all, £25 for a whole year per annum. Um, also, there couldn't be a better time to join the RSL and be the first to hear our forthcoming events, particularly um, Dalloway Day, our annual celebration of all things Virginia Woolf. <laughs> you know, it's on um, Wednesday in mid-June, as it says in the novel. So tomorrow we'll be announcing the stellar lineup for this year's Dalloway Day. You'll be able to attend everything from wherever you are in the universe. So to be sure to sign up online or at our membership desk, which is waiting for you outside, uh, where um, Amanda will be to sign his book, Pandemonium, which is uh, freshly there waiting outside in its stacks. And if you're um, watching us online, you can buy a copy too by pressing the bookshop button, apparently. Is that right, Lily? Oh. There's a bookshop button you can press and buy from a good, reliable bookseller. And so we'd also like to thank our volunteers. Thank you, volunteers. And all our friends at the British Library, particularly John Fawcett, B. Rowlett and Brett Walsh. And John Stetheridge and Rebecca Godley at Unique Media for making it possible for so many of us to come together tonight. 
And my final thank you before I ask for another round of applause is to Lily Blacksell, who's just sat in the front row with the microphone, the lady with the microphone, the young kid with the microphone, who is our <laughs> RSL's events and partnership manager. And this is her first in-person event Yay. for us. <laughs> well done, Lily. <laughs> Hasn't she done well? We'll tell you all that in person as well. You've done really well, Lily. I feel proud as a father watching their child take their first step. <laughs> thank you, Lily. Dear child. And finally, thank you all for joining us. And um, please join me finally another huge round of applause for our incredible duo, Amanda uh, and Amanda.